Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the second edition of the Velvet Innovation Conference 2022, an annual event of an innovation ecosystem of South Moravia. I'm Martina Pouchla, and I'm honored to be your host for today's journey through the most challenging issues of today's world of business. Last year, we established a tradition of meeting together and learning from the very best. A year after, we are meeting again. Who took the seats in the audience today? Local entrepreneurs, C-level managers of big corporations, startups that are building their first companies from scratch, enlightened policymakers and dedicated officers, ambitious scientists and visionaries, NGO people working to make in this world better, local patriots and stars from abroad. We are very happy that you came here to get informed, to get inspired and to get engaged with each other. You are invited here to stop doing what you are normally doing on Thursday afternoon. So let's take this chance and let's focus for the next few hours on the business trends of the post-pandemic world, the world facing the climate crisis, the new geopolitical situation and other challenges. Before we start, I would like to welcome Petr Chladek, CEO of GIC, the main organizer of this event, to share a few words with you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much that you came. I warmly welcome you all here, people from businesses, uh, uh, from academia, uh, policymakers, politicians, uh, representatives on NGOs. It is really an honor to have you here. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to remind you why, why we organize such an event. Uh, we want to inspire you. We want to create a space for new contacts, new encounters, and also, we would, would like to show you the successes of uh, the Brno region innovation ecosystem, what we are proud of. Um, I want to really talk short, but I've got to share one, one, uh, one thought uh, which um, uh, strikes me these days. I think uh, we live in kind of paradox times. On the one hand, we, fa we face uh, short-term challenges like a uh, COVID-19, broke up of value chains, a Russian aggression to, to Ukraine, um, inflation, energy prices, you name it. On the one hand, we face um, long-term challenges, um, insecurity, climate change, um, dictatorship rising, unpredictable China, and etc. Well, I think it's truly, truly difficult times, and the solutions for these challenges, short term, long term, uh, can be difficult to find. But that's also the reason why we invite you here to create space, to share uh, your thoughts, your, your, your ideas, how to tackle them. We at JIC, we believe that entrepreneurship is at first about solving problems. Money comes afterwards. That's, 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 that's the reason why, why, why we are here. That's the reason why we try to build up a community, the innovation ecosystem, where new solutions are uh, created and where we perceive challenges as an opportunity. So use this time as an opportunity. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I've got to also say one, one more thing. Uh, this event would not be able to, uh, to or organize without our general sponsors. I thank you very much to all, all of them, but uh, I've got to mention three of them, the main one. First of all, Hannibal. So thank you very much. Tomasz and, and um, here, thank you very much. <laughs> He's the guy who drives it. Uh, second, SAP, Martin Anacek. Also, he's, he's the, the one. And third, term of your scientific, Petr Strelas, also please applause for him. Thank you very much. Well, 
that's everything from me. Enjoy it. Enjoy this afternoon. Thank you very much once again that you came. Thank you. Thank you very much for reminding us why we are here and thanks to who we are here. The audience here is unique as well as the support of not only these technological partners, but also uh, of people that are governing our region. And this is why we are delighted to have them with us today. So it's time to meet Mr. Jan Grolich, the governor of South Moravia that is about to open the whole event. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's an honor for me to open this event and welcome you here as a governor of South Moravia. The first edition of uh, Velvet Innovation set the bar very high. Even in Prague, they envy us this event and the speakers, so that's the first sign that we did it very well. And that's why I'm very uh, curious about this one. I have been to many events uh, organized by politicians when uh, they use public money to pay for the banquet and to invite important businessmen and VIPs to shake hands and to have formal talk and remind the previous uh, success. But uh, this is completely opposite. People from business, academia and politics uh, come together and they want to work together for, um, of the innovation. And uh, even the biggest fans of this, uh, of this event uh, paid for this occasion, including the banquet, so thanks a lot. But seriously, last time we have met uh, during the time of COVID. It was not the end of COVID, but let's say the pause between two big waves. And uh, it was a very, very difficult time for business, and I think there were two types of uh, business people at that time. The first one who was turning to the politicians all the time saying, we need, we demand, and government should do. And the others was dealing with the crisis and find a lot of uh, innovative way how to deal with the crisis and offered the solution. And we are here again, and we have the other crisis ahead to deal with. This time, the one caused by Russian aggression in Ukraine. We need to manage the energy transition that we had planned to postpone until 2050, let's say. But now we have to deal with it in uh, maybe years, but maybe in the months. This is a very challenging period for economy and we need uh, new innovations, uh, researches, and new ideas. And there is only one certain thing, and it is that uh, a lot of uh, new challenges will come up every year. So I look forward to seeing uh, what you will come up with today. And instead of saying that, oh, they need something again from me again, uh, I say I want to be part of it. And thank you so much for your time, uh, for your inspiration, and uh, for your will to make a difference. And I am very proud that we have created atmosphere where you all feel free to come together. Big applause. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Governor, for your welcoming note in a great style. So what's on the menu for this afternoon? Today's program will introduce the future trends that will shape the way we make, spend or save our money. With the help of people, people offering different perspectives, we will approach the European Green Deal as a business opportunity. We will meet the most promising startups and learn together from feedback and advice that will be provided by an expert panel composed of seasoned entrepreneurs, investors and technologists. We will debate sustainability in practice and discuss funding opportunities for sustainable businesses. And of course, in the meantime, we will have great coffee, drinks and food, and last but not least, the energizing company of all of you. Before we get to the first keynote, let me add some technical information. We kindly ask you to switch off the sound on your mobile phones so we can all enjoy the whole event not disturbed. 
but don't turn your mobile phones off completely because you will need a swap card application. You are maybe familiar with the application from the last edition of the Velvet Innovation Conference or from the Velvet Innovation Meetups. It's a very useful tool. You can find a lot of information there about today's agenda, speakers or attendees. Also, voting for the best pitch will be done in the application. If you haven't downloaded it yet, then look for the QR codes that are placed on the tables on the side of this room. We would also like to encourage you to share your experience with the conference on your social network. So if you take any nice photo, a selfie with someone that you admire, or if you have an inspiring comment, then please use hashtag Brno Region and Velvet Innovation so we can all read it and react. So this is all for now. Let's get the program started. The first keynote speech. According to Frost and Sullivan, there is a direct correlation between sustainable business practices, climate-friendly investments, and business performance. It results in increased profitability and stronger financials. Therefore, sustainability and going green is seen as the path to prosperity and long-term profits. Companies of all sizes take active steps to embrace the benefits of green economy and sustainable future. Does it sound too optimistic? Maybe. Let's check it with the data. Digital sustainability is the headline of the keynote speech that will present some of the results of Frost and Sullivan research. How do companies perceive sustainability? What shapes their motives for adopting sustainability principles? What are the digital sustainability trends that we are witnessing this year? Let's look for the answers with Frederick Royan, who currently leads the sustainability and circular economy practice at Frost and Sullivan. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Firstly, thanks for the opportunity for me to come and present, um, especially here in the beautiful city of Brno, uh, in the Moravian region. And it's a tough act to follow the Mr. Governor with his uh, musical end uh, on that. Uh, my name is Frederick Royan. Uh, I lead the sustainability and the circular economy practice at Frost & Sullivan. Um, what I would like to present is some of the insights of a research paper that we developed in partnership with Autodesk. I've just got back uh, from my hometown, Bangalore. I don't know how much of you uh, would know Bangalore. It's a city in southern India. It's also called the Silicon Valley of uh, uh, India. It has around 80% of global IT companies present there, contributing around 40 billion to the local economy. Last week, it witnessed the heaviest rainfall. Um, it was around 13 centimeters of rainfall in one day which led to flush flooding and areas um, with water levels of around four, four feet and brought the city to a standstill. The overall economic loss in one of the areas was estimated to be around $28 million. So it is a huge, huge uh, impact that uh, extreme weather events are playing. So what do we see as the forces of change then? The net zero 2050 goal for Europe and the supporting policy framework in the shape of the Green Deal is setting the path for both industry and both environment to invest in mitigation and adaptation measures. When we initiated this research, we were in the midst of the pandemic. And the objective was to understand how customers and suppliers were evaluating the role and importance of sustainability and the potential for digital solutions to address key unmet needs, and more importantly, to tap into productivity benefits, what people also called as the digital productivity bonus of around 15 to 25%. However, there's an increased pace, there's a need for increased pace and scale of the trans transformation and uh, transition. As the mayor mentioned, you know, we were looking at 2050, Possibly it's too late. We need to increase both speed and scale. 
And the research highlighted four key market forces, what we call as industry transformation, but you can also call them as industry transition, sustainability, digitalization, health and wellness, and business models. The Green Deal is driving the energy and material transition of the circular economy of Europe, the urgency for decarbonization and the recent geopolitical risks have heightened energy security issues and is driving a shift to green electrification and renewable natural gas with investments focused on sustainability by energy security, energy efficiency, and resilience. On the second change, we look at digitalization, which is looking at unlocking the digital productivity bonus of 15 to 20%, locked up in silos uh, within operations uh, of industry. There's an increasing volume of data. There's an increasing use of AI and ML to scale up and speed up transformation, as well as to deliver significant operational savings. We see an increasing role of robotics in 3D printing, showing promising results in areas such as construction, where we can reduce the consumption of uh, materials such as concrete by around 70%, as well as manufacturing of key materials and products such as pipes in steel manufacturing. When you look at cities, there is a deterioration of the air quality in cities. And we're also now seeing a, a, a focus on internal environment, or the quality of the air within buildings in a post-COVID world. And it has enhanced attention on health and wellness in city environment and within buildings. Healthy building certifications have witnessed a spike in growth, as well as energy efficiency and environment quality management within buildings. And cities, which will become increasingly more important, more measures are expected around compliance and monitoring. And the last element is business models. And this is what we call as platforms, an opportunity for entrepreneurs to come together, understand what is the unmet needs, how do you can connect the dots, create a, a valuable product, which is bringing uh, valuable benefits for your customer, but enhancing the customer interaction element. The platform businesses, I think, is an exciting area that we see, what we call as X as a service. So what has this created? It's created a market of digital sustainability, which we estimate to be around close to a trillion dollars by 2030. And it's going to be shaped by collaborative opportunities around water, energy, and resource regeneration across the value chains of built environment, industry, especially with the increasing inter interdependence on critical resources. The ultimate objective is, this, is for all stakeholders across the value chain to achieve their key goals linked to specific SDG goals, such as climate action and responsible consumption and production. Digital solutions such as BIM and digital twins, AI and ML, form a key enabler in identifying and establishing synergies across industries together with the sustainability business frameworks models such as sustainability as a service, net zero cities and industries, as well as green feedstocks for fuels. For, for this research, we leverage the vertical industry expertise of Frost and Sullivan in key areas such as homes and buildings, industrial automation, energy, chemicals, and mobility, which has been instrumental in analyzing and identifying key growth opportunities in built environment and manufacturing across Europe. The research also highlighted opportunities of a new kind, SDG3, health and wellness, and, building, <clears throat> and wellness in buildings and cities, as well as SDG15, which is looking at life on land with areas such as biodiversity and related focus in construction, as we have legislative requirements such as biodiversity net gain in the, in the UK transforming this sector. So how did we start this process? <clears throat> so it was a process of researching the customers. You know, it is extremely important to speak to the customers and understand you know, what is their perception of sustainability, what are the unmet needs, and what are the opportunities, and how do you deliver some of these solutions? So the customer research involved around 600 companies uh, in three key regions, Nordics, Benelux, and the UK and Ireland. The sample was also proportion, was aimed to capture insights across different organization sizes in both manufacturing and AEC, especially in AEC, architecture, engineering, and construction, where you have companies of even 10 people, and it could go companies ranging in the thousands of people. And manufacturing involved consumer products to industrial manufacturing. 
Given the carbon intensity of the AEC sector, it accounted for close to two-thirds of the sample, with a greater focus on construction services. What was the top-level finding that we saw in the results? Two-thirds of the companies interviewed, these are customer companies who buy solutions and services for sustainability, they think that sustainability is a core part of the strategic vision. And this is companies in the midst of the pandemic. If anything, this has increased even further. 64% understand sustainability as a formal strategic vision in, in the leadership approach. And this was also evident from the discussions with the heads of sustainability that have been using the SDG frameworks in developing strategic plans. About 75% of manufacturing companies have sustainability as a part of the strategic vision largely due to the significant environmental impact associated to manufacturing. And the AE segment is a bit more ahead. However, construction segment is not far behind. And it's important to see the distinction here, because when you look at the AEC, we think that it's a homogeneous space. It's not. You have the architecture and engineering space, and you have the construction space. And right now, there's a disconnect, and where digital plays a role of bridging the gap between the AE and C space. So what are the challenges? Um, so challenges are relatively higher in Benelux and, and the UK and Ireland compared to Nordics. This was quite a revealing uh, piece of insight that we felt. You know, it indicated Nordics is pretty far ahead on the maturity curve when it comes to sustainability. There's a lack of financial resources committed to sustainability, in, in, and the biggest challenge, in, uh, and that is in Benelux and the UK and Ireland. Now, this highlights an opportunity to ha to see how we can translate the ROI, the return on investment of digital solutions. And we're already seeing some strong use cases coming up in this, in areas such as digital twins in the water sector, on the energy sector, as well as leakage in the water side. There's a relatively higher degree of maturing in terms of sustainability in Nordics, um, reflected with low level of challenges in terms of access to software and technology being the latest, least challenging. However, the challenge is higher in UK and Ireland and Benelux, highlighting uh, opportunity there um, in terms of softwares. The other interesting opportunity from this analysis for me was skills and training. Skills and training is a key challenge, especially in the Benelux and UK and Ireland, and presents an opportunity for edtech tools around sustainability to support the needs across manufacturing and AEC. I think, what's the overall driver for sustainability? <clears throat> People would have thought that regulation would be the topmost driver when it comes to sustainability. What was revealing from this analysis, regulation was further down in terms of a priority. Investors also was further down. You know, when the World Economic Forum report came a couple of years ago, investors were top of the agenda, but this came right at the bottom of the agenda. So investors and market forces, as well as regulation, very less in terms of priority. 75% indicated competitive advantage with sustainability at a corporate level, and this was linked with the customer retention and customer expectations. Customers are driving sustainability at these companies. It's less to do with regulation, it's more to do with the customer needs. So, where do we see the investments in terms of opportunities? What we try to understand from customers is, where are they investing? What are the challenges? And where do they see the opportunities? The biggest investment areas that we, that we heard from the analysis was workflows, compliance, and the role that technology and software can play here. Companies are already investing in this, because in any organization, the biggest challenge is people operating in silos and not being able to speak with each other. And when we look at workflows, it's the same challenge. With sustainability, you need to connect the dots. The more you connect the dots, the better you are at identifying the synergies and looking at these opportunities. So there's a huge opportunity here for improved workflows and the investment on software is focused on sustainable technology. And we see a huge area of investment in this particular area. What is the, the next area that we see? There's a lot of talk of AI. The, you know, I'm actually speaking at uh, the World Summit AI in Amsterdam. It's a big, big, hot focus area here. 
So there's a lot of opportunity people are talking about, machine learning and AI, and we see a strong demand here on the Nordics. The reason here also is linked with the maturity level that you have when it comes to sustainability. It's very well entrenched in the companies there that, you, that are able to utilize this particular opportunity. But I think the opportunity when it comes to machine learning or AI and trying to utilize these capabilities, the biggest area for me and which came out from this research is supply chain collaboration. Companies are looking to tackle scope three emissions. They've done really well in scope one and two, but right now the shift is more on to scope three. And when they look at scope three, there are huge bottlenecks that they, that they need to address when it comes to supply chain collaboration. And the highest need is in manufacturing in Benelux and UK and Ireland. As well as a big market is reporting. Reporting of sustainability approaches combined with new data and insights is a common need across regions. When I joined Frost and Sullivan in 2004, I joined there as an analyst focusing on the water sector. That's been one of my biggest passions. And it's great to see a digital transformation getting into the water sector right now, which has usually been perceived more of a less tech savvy sector. We're seeing transformation across the energy and water industry, which is generating new customer centric business models leading to smart enabled business services. There are significant investments made in smart water grid, which will continue going forward with investments focused on leakage, particularly, where some of the countries have leakage levels of around 30 to 40 percent. This is non-revenue water losses, which, if can be addressed, both can address economic savings, but more importantly, energy benefits, um, given the energy prices that have shot up at these utilities. And we're seeing investments also on smart water metering and a shift from AMR to AMI. UK, for example, has only around 40% of households which have meters, and all the water utilities now have a rollout program to install smart water meters across the UK. Investments are also increasing in setting up digital twins for utilities, and this will involve investment right from design engineering and creating a replica of physical assets and deployment of sensors for effective data gathering and synchronization. This is set to play a transformative role in water utilities faced with extreme weather events and future-proofing their infrastructure and services. Just to give you a couple of insights on the water side, water utilities are certainly stepping up their investments uh, when it comes to digital solutions. And what is the reason for that? Outcomes. Digital solutions are able to provide utilities the goal of reaching some of the key outcomes. And you can see some of the key outcomes that Offvat has set up on water utilities. It's got leakage, it's got pollution incidents, and it's got many other different elements. And also the color coding gives you an indication of utilities, some which are leading, some which are average, and some which are behind. And when it comes to leakage, Anglian Water is pretty much a benchmark when it comes to the UK water utility space. It's got the lowest level of leakage and 20% leakage reduction achieved since 2010. The focus on smart water so far has been on the water networks, but now we're seeing a transition looking at the wastewater network, where there's a lot of interest on digital solutions for the sewage network, and Wessex Water is set to deploy an AR technology across its wastewater network of 35,000 kilometers, which is going to be a world's first. A few case studies um, as well from the research which we did on uh, Autodesk. No consult again, uh, uh, an engineering uh, consulting firm focused on the building side. And they see an increasing interest in micro and macro perspectives and how they bring data to help customers to set better goals and on long-term targets. All their customers for NOL consult are state building corporations, and which also includes hospitals. And hospitals as well now are setting up new sustainability targets as a top priority. And NOR Consult has its own machine learning division and use big data to drive sustainability across these customer and projects across. Landsec is, um, on the other hand, focuses on uh, buildings, commercial buildings. So Landsec has, I would say, one of the largest portfolio of commercial buildings. And the, the Forge building has a Bream Excellent rating. 
and 44% reduction of carbon emissions against Part L, as well as surpassing the Greater London Authority target. 22% reduction in embodied carbon and 100% renewable electricity, as well as the Well 2 standards. Levington Street, it was designed by Bennett's uh, architects, the first engineering architectural practice to set themselves science-based targets. A couple of other use cases I wanted to share. One is MACE, again, a design engineering firm, and two of their flagships <coughs> projects is the uh, cloud-based construction management for Facebook, uh, the data center over there, and also the, um, the factory, called the Rising Factory in the Olympic Park. 90% of that was built off-site, indicating the opportunity there for prefab and modular construction um, over there. On the right-hand side is Audico. Um, uh, Audico is uh, specialized in uh, robotics and 3D printing, one of the first uh, to, um, to develop solutions comprising of wire cutting. The concrete sector, I think form work is one of the biggest costs in the concrete sector. It's around 60% of costs in concrete projects is form work. And with 3D printing and robotics, you're able to reduce that significantly. And once you reduce form work, you also reduce the amount of concrete use. Some of the, the projects that they've been involved is, it's resulted in reductions of concrete around 60 to 70%. It's not just the volume of concrete, then the cascading impact it has on carbon reductions as well. And I think that's quite an interesting and a significant opportunity that we have in Europe with the built environment and uh, the challenges that focus uh, it presents of reduction of carbon emissions. And a very interesting solution also that they're developing is the factory on the fly. Um, this is trying to really deploy solutions on the ground and how you can benefit from that. Over well, the last couple of months, I've been focusing a bit more on AI for sustainability. Um, and there are three, three companies which I've, I've seen are very exciting in, in how they're using AI for um, sustainability. AI Dash, Dash um, it's a recent startup, only established in 2019. And they use satellite imaging. Um, and with satellite imaging, they combine AI. And one of the key solutions there is for biodiversity mapping. And um, they've already kind of installed this in uh, uh, National Grid um, in, in the UK, and quite strong in the US. Uh, vegetation management um, is possibly around a $20 billion industry, just in the US alone. And um, what these solutions present is when you combine satellite imaging with uh, AI solutions, it's both the scale, speed, and savings that these solutions present. And more importantly, these solutions can be repurposed. These solutions are also being deployed when it comes to methane emissions monitoring as well as water quality monitoring. EverImpact is again using satellite imaging, but more for greenhouse gas emission monitoring. Cities have a big challenge. Most of the data that you have for carbon emissions is not fit for purpose. It's old, inaccurate, and what EverImpact and similar organizations are doing is combining satellite imaging with sensors, how they can provide accurate data at scale and presenting significant uh, savings for, for the cities. And that helps cities to then use the data to create climate, uh, climate uh, action plans and to see how they address that. And the third example is Loopfront. Um, Loopfront uh, is looking at what we call as buildings as material banks, the opportunity of uh, recovering materials from recycling of old buildings. Just last couple of slides I wanted to present is what is the current and future trends of manufacturing? So in the manufacturing space, I think the biggest opportunity is the carbon neutral manufacturing. You know, so that I think is one of the biggest opportunities which we see there. And followed, we see material alternatives. Uh, there's a lot of interest in tools for life cycle assessment and the role that um, embodied carbon as a topic is picking up. And then we have the third one, which is uh, the material efficiency and light weighting. You know, the light weighting of materials and how that presents an opportunity in the, mature, uh, in the manufacturing space. And the, la the last slide I have is on the current and future trends of sustainability in AEC. In the AEC space, embodied carbon has become a very, very big topic. And that is becoming a huge focus across the AEC space. 
There's a heightened kind of focus on emb embodied carbon, and it's reflected with strong current forces on material alternatives. And the other area is net zero um, kind of uh, energy in buildings, but also zero waste in lean, lean construction, which uh, highlights strong prospects for prefab and modular construction. So that's it from my side. I hope you all found it uh, useful. Um, and yeah, glad to hear your thoughts on what is presented even after uh, during, during the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for an important insight into Western market. And we will stick to building sector now. Transforming buildings is an important element of addressing the climate crisis. They represent almost 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Kingsman Company is uniquely placed to help support decarbonization of the building sector. They do it via their extensive offering of high performance energy saving systems and solutions. In 2021, their insulation products sold globally were estimated to save almost 200 million tons of CO2 over their lifetime. The lifetime carbon savings of their insulation systems sold in 2021 are expected to be more than 26 times higher than their 2021 value chain carbon footprint. So how to be sustainable in a business that produces huge amounts of carbon dioxide? What helps them being fully committed to reducing the impact of their key products? And how do they succeed in keeping their high performance at the same time? These are questions for the next keynote speaker, Mike Stenson from Kingspan Group. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to um, uh, present today. Um, I'm going to talk about um, uh, the Kingspan Group and what we do from a sustainability point of view. Hopefully there'll be some degree of commonality with the Frederick. Um, the, in the picture behind on the screen um, is our innovation centre, uh, which we built in Ireland, uh, opened it at the end of 2019. And uh, it's a fully digital uh, twin uh, developed uh, building with um, a big focus on both net zero energy and as low a po as possible uh, car embodied carbon um, included in the building. So I'm going to talk about the slide, an introduction, a few slides about what we do and who we are, and how we make sustainability um, the focus of everything we do every day that we go to work, and a cornerstone of our success. And the other thing that's also very important, of course, is that um, there have been, there are, and there will be many, many uh, challenges uh, along the way. So the Kingsman Group um, was founded in Ireland in the mid late 1960s uh, by two brothers, uh, one of whom just retired as our uh, chairman last year when he turned 80. And um, they started making car trailers, if you like, above um, uh, anything else. And, and uh, they migrated to the point where you know, the company today, have, we have uh, more than 200 facilities across the world with uh, revenue that you can read on the screen here, employees, etc. Um, and we are very ambitious about taking the group to the next level of uh, growth uh, as well. The mission we have is to accelerate a net zero emissions future in the built environment with the well-being of people and the planet um, at heart. We have a variety of solutions that um, basically... Um, just give me one sec. Um, a variety of solutions that for mainly for industrial and commercial buildings rather than domestic, even though we do something in the domestic space, walls, roofs, uh, daylighting solutions, not glass, um, uh, water and energy solutions for storage of water, rainwater recovery systems, flooring, lots of insulation that you heard from in the introduction, as well as this uh, new product where we've integrated a solar solution for generating solar into industrial buildings directly into our product set. So, um, so there's a lot of different, uh, different solutions there, but uh, as, we, as we move forward um, into this Planet Passionate program, which is our 10-year uh, 
uh, global sustainability uh, program. And we started this, if you like, way, way back in probably 2008, 2009, where we st set out a net zero energy uh, program. And that's very important because energy then was expensive. It's a lot more expensive now. So the first version, the first probably 10 years was focused on minimizing energy, managing energy improvement programs, and saving a lot of money by, by doing that. We then transitioned into this Planet Passionate, which is focused on climate change, on circularity, and uh, protection of the natural world. We have four sets of targets around carbon, energy, circularity, and water. And they are wide-ranging and across the entire um, uh, group. I'm not going to go and read all, all of them, but um, having net zero carbon manufacturing by 2030 and having a 50% reduction in our um, embodied uh, 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 carbon um, are two critical goals for us along with man many others. What's most important, I suppose, is what it, what it does across in terms of some of the challenges that we have had and have had to overcome. Um, the attainment of these targets are all um, embedded in the remuneration program of all managers and executives. Um, so it's directly linked to performance, and uh, that has been critical in terms of getting that whole buy-in um, across the group. We have lots of processes, lots of programs across the 200 sites um, in terms of making sure that we do this because it's a strategic pillar of the business model that we have. Uh, all acquisitions that we are working with, doing, talking with, etc., are all screened in terms of their impact on the embodied carbon and the amount of CO2 emissions that they will bring to the group. And every acquisition we do get about six months sort of like a grace period to effectively get a program in place to, um, to, to do this. Uh, we also have to work an awful lot with our suppliers, you'll see in the next couple of slides. And uh, starting from the 1st of uh, January in uh, uh, this year, we are uh, going to have an internal carbon price. So every factory across the world has to calculate how much See on a, how much, how many tons of CO2 that they emit from their processes and their um, um, materials that they use, and uh, they get basically a tax to their P&L. So here in the Czech Republic, we have a very large facility in the um, in in Hradec Králové, and um, those guys are will know exactly how many tons of carbon they uh, emit during the year, both in the process and the materials, and um, whatever their profit is, will get modified by, by that tax. And that's a way of encouraging, again, you know, people to overcome obstacles and overcome um, issues that are associated with not being able to, to, uh, to do this. So we've created, under this Planet Passionate program, the 2030 Carbon uh, Pathway. And it's made up, as you can see there, of both the supply chain, value chain, of our supply base, our internal operations, and also the use of our products. And you heard some statistics about how from an insulation and from a, a CO2 saving point of view, the products work in situ, and that's very true. But we, ha we are seeing this huge shift that Frederick referred to in terms of the calculation of the embodied carbon in the products that we sell. Uh, so when we talk to architects and talk to other people about using our materials, there's more and more questions being asked about the embodied carbon content of the steel and of the foam and of the uh, mineral fiber and all the other uh, materials that we use. So therefore, it's absolutely essential that this is a collaborative approach with the supply base because we cannot do it on our own. And you can see um, that on, the, uh, on this slide, on the next slide, the... Um, you can see that in terms of the totality of our carbon uh, bill, if you like, 78% of that comes from the supply base. And the balance is what we do internally. So we have a huge task. You can see there the numbers, 4 million tons from our supply base. So obviously we can't do that without getting those on board and working with them. Um, so there's a lot of collaboration um, with, with, the, with, the, with the suppliers. And one of the things we have done um, 
as a big player, let's say, even though, as I said, we started with one factory in a small village uh, with 1,000 people in Ireland. Uh, one thing that we are doing is we have made an investment in a Swedish-based green steel manufacturing company called H2 Green Steel, who will basically use a completely new method of making steel that doesn't rely at all on any fossil fuel. And it'll be one of the first, not, not the first, but it'll be among the first in the world to do that. And that will come on stream probably the end of 2024 or early 2025. So that has the possibility of transforming the, you know, what, what Frederick referred to as this embodied carbon in the steel. So how many tons of CO2 was emitted during the manufacturing of the steel? And today that is quite substantial when you consider uh, the fossil fuel-based economy that, that, that's, that's used in that. So um, we also have a lot of internal actions in terms of moving our own manufacturing facilities, but as we can see there, the big picture is on the, um, with, the, with the suppliers. And we then have a whole series of products, and you'll see again when I talk about innovation in a couple of minutes, some are, have been released and some are about to be released, um, and, and, and so on. So, um, the, my role is in terms of innovation and driving the innovation agenda across the group. I used to uh, manage our manufacturing operations across uh, Central Europe, based, in, uh, based out of Radis Kralove. So, the innovation drivers have to be intrinsically linked with what I just showed you there from our sustainability program. And right up at the top of it is our decarbonization agenda. So, we want to... Uh, effectively decarbonize the product set and launch new products that are lower in carbon by definition. We have a huge program that's really only getting started uh, on circularity and how we reuse material again and again. You know, historically, and again, the previous speaker referred to this in terms of waste uh, and being, you know, and the opportunity for, for reusing waste. Um, most of the waste of our materials that went to job sites and construction sites all over the world typically at the, when the construction site was finished, got uh, thrown into a landfill or a dump. Um, we now have developed technology to be able to reuse that material. Now, the supply chain to do that and you know, across the world doesn't yet exist. So we've kicked it off by taking back any waste we create of our own products uh, uh, in, in our factories and, and so on. But ultimately, uh, you know, the supply chain and the new business models for that will get, will get um, uh, developed. The third one and the third key area of innovation is very, um, you know, we've been at it for a couple of years, is around energy management. And the concept we're trying to work on is, can the building skin, which we supply lots of, can that be used as a way of storing and releasing energy to optimize the cost of energy? Uh, that piece of work, can't really get into too much details about it right now, that's early stage uh, development work that, um, that we're engaged in. Um, from an automation point of view, we are working on programs to try, from a construction point of view, uh, not, not, not internally, I mean, there's a lot of work we need to do in our factories to automate and improve, but this is really in terms of how can we make it easier for customers to um, use our products and to apply them more efficiently, better, and in a less labor-intensive way. We have huge issues, you know, that's, that's going to come up in the UK in the next five to ten years, which is a big market for us. Um, where the lack of labor is going to affect people's ability to build buildings, right? And that will become a problem, you know, across the Western world, um, and therefore automation and using robotics and uh, the like for uh, uh, assembling our, our, our material. We are seeing an emerging trend, again, was referenced in the previous slide, <clears throat> uh, about the use of uh, healthy materials and healthy buildings. Now, this is early stage stuff, but there are moves afoot at the, at the European level to um, either ban, tag, label uh, lots of different types of materials that, um, uh, can be, uh, that, that are used uh, commonly today. And therefore, how do we work around and find, find alternate uh, solutions? And then the, the last key driver from an innovation point of view is around digitalization. And again, you know, digital twins, use of data, all of these things up to now have been completely alien to the construction industry. And many other industries have moved way ahead of that, but there is this emerging 
shift that actually will happen, I think, quite quickly over the next uh, five years. Y if, if you look at digital twins, I'm sure somewhere in this building here is the, are the blueprints, stored probably somewhere, probably in a big folder or a set of folders, and all of that stuff can now go to the cloud. And the cloud software allows you to effectively manage the building as well as get all the information about everything in the building. Um, and, th and that's the future from a digitalization point of view, in addition to how we might, will make it easier, are making it easier for customers to work with us. So we have um, lots of products that are under development and um, uh, being released uh, th that basically, again, will have just a much lower uh, level of embodied carbon. And that's really the theme. And whether that's a, re a, a storage tank, we have quite a big business, sales business here in the Czech Republic, um, that uh, does that, whether it's the um, uh, raised access floors for data centers and whatever, um, all of that stuff, again, the whole focus is on how do we have it as low a carbon as possible and how do we make it as recyclable as possible. And we're not there, and you know, this has not been an easy journey and there's lots of obstacles that still remain, but we're, you know, if, we, if we look at our numbers, we look at what we've done, and we're very optimistic about the possibilities to the future. So that's en enough about uh, Kingspan. Um, what I want to finish up on the next couple of slides <clears throat> is really around, you know, my recommendations or our recommendations in terms of, you know, the action plan. And we understand because, you know, we came from, you know, a very small business and we all had to start somewhere and we understand that. But, but effectively, if you, I mean, our view would be, and it's even more important today because of the energy catastrophe that's, that, that's around us, is to start to measure energy, uh, energy consumption. Uh, energy efficiency, and you know, use that to um, try and drive some PNL opportunities to improve the operating performance of the business. That's where we started, and we found you know the possibility of saving energy in the most unusual of places. Everybody said it's you know machine A, and it turned out to be compressor B it, that was actually consuming. Now it does take a bit of effort and some money and so on and so on, but but the payback on that has been has been um, incredible. I think it's very important that we all work collaboratively with um, suppliers um, as well as internally to, to start to measure how much and how uh, CO2 um, are we emitting. And the one thing that nobody can dispute, I mean, there's lots of people who will debate about various aspects of the climate crisis, but there's no disputing about the fact that the CO2 level in the atmosphere is twice what it was, whatever, 100, 150 years ago. So therefore, we can start to work to measure and what's our contribution uh, to that. And then obviously, you know, we make plans to reduce, to replace, to improve. And it's very important in our experience, based on our, not only our plan of passion, but everything else we do, is to set some very clear targets, measurables, and then really, really push to, um, to, uh, to make them happen. I'd also suggest that, you know, and again, you know, from an innovation point of view, of course we would, but you know, to, to effectively any new product or new idea that we're engaged in, whether we're big or small, that, um, that the innovation around that um, is, is all focused on reducing the uh, CO2 that the product or the service uh, emits. And I think if everyone, if, if you stand back and think, well, if every one of us did that, then we're going to make a dent in the or an, an imprint in the, in the uh, level of CO2 that's, that's there today. Now, of course, um, and notwithstanding what um, the, uh, our governor said earlier on, um, there, there is a need and will be a need for some level of uh, government, or, uh, both, let's say, local, regional, national, and at EU level in terms of uh, facilitating and supporting that change. But at the end of the day, I know from a Kingspan point of view and me personally, it's all about what do we do ourselves because uh, that's, that's at the end of the day what it's, what it's, what it's about. So moving on uh, from a supporting point of view, the last point is very, I think, very important. Um, we need uh, to, to avoid greenwashing and doing things purely from a marketing point of view because you know, there's enough of people who are, let's say, not, not certain about if this is the right thing to do in terms of the transition, that the last thing we want is to you know, make false statements, is to have incorrect information, and to not be really and truly genuine about affecting this lower embodied uh, uh, carbon uh, uh, direction of travel. So th th you know, th th that's, that's our action plan. That's what worked for us. I, I think it's, it's common enough that it can work for, for lots of, um, 
of organizations, uh, big and small. Some of the challenges, I mean, I talked about materials. I mean, when we talked to our first supplier, our big suppliers in 2018, I think, about this idea, not one of them had even considered that this could become a reality. They were saying maybe in 30 years, right? Um, and now, you know, they're all engaged at varying speeds and varying results, but they're all now engaged. And therefore, we have to work with the materials and the whole supply chain. Um, again, whoever they are. I know it's a cliche, as we say, but, um, but you know, working with people and getting them on board and bringing them along with this and bringing them in a way that it becomes supportive, that it becomes, that they can become enthusiastic about it and not be seen as, you know, telling you must, you mustn't, et cetera, et cetera. We have to bring people with us, uh, both our employees as well as uh, customers and suppliers. And we need to have a process, and, and lots of us don't have processes and haven't had them, and that has been a huge challenge for us to try and do this uh, across, across the globe. Uh, also, you know, in, in construction, many customers have, have, you know, fundamentally not really too much of an interest in this. Um, but again, it's, it's changing, um, and therefore therein lies an opportunity um, um, as, as well. So it's, it's, it's a double-edged uh, sword, as you say in English. So my last slide is really to um, talk about the key steps. Uh, again, I emphasize about starting somewhere. Uh, you, can, you, know, you can start anywhere, but you know, energy is a, is a genuine cost. And can we do something, uh, starting with measuring it, and how do we uh, make a plan to reduce it? And it may need investment, and that may be an issue, and we understand that. Um, the other thing is to treat waste as a resource. I mean, historically, it was thrown away. Uh, I, I personally believe in another, you know, over the next 30 years, waste material will become the, um, let, let's say, the material of use. Uh, you know, imagine if, if extraction was prohibited, and it could happen, I, I don't know if it will, but if it was to happen, then we're going to have to make do with the material that we have, but we have a lot of it, wasted. Measure CO2 levels and make a plan, and most importantly, and I know, again, this is a kind of a cliche, but we should... Um, drive this ourselves from the top of the organization collaboratively and uh, don't stay still from an innovation uh, perspective. So th th that's my, my piece. Um, I hope it's, it was of interest to you and that maybe you might pick up something and I'd be happy to discuss anything about it uh, later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike, for a very useful advice and recommendation and specific experience from a specific company. And now a discussion, a panel discussion. Presented in 2019, the objective of the European Green Deal is for the EU to become the very first climate neutral continent by 2050. The result should be a cleaner environment, more affordable energy, smarter transport, new jobs, and an overall better quality of life. Now, almost three years later, we find ourselves in a world facing new pandemic waves multiple times a year and Russian aggression and its blackmailing with its gas. Does it make the Green Deal less important or even more appealing? Is it a burden for the private sector or a compass into a brighter future? How likely is it to impact Czech industry? These and more questions will be at the focus for the next 60 minutes. Green Deal and the challenges it brings will be discussed by our four outstanding guests and I will invite them to you and I will ask them to come on stage to join me. The first of them is Kurt van der Berge from European Commission Green Deal advisor from the cabinet of President Ursula von der Leyen. So come and join me. <laughs> Next panelist is Radek Spitzar, Vice President of Confederation of Industry of the Czech Republic. Welcome. <laughs> from the private sector, Juraj Shabatka. Chief Sales Officer and Chief Financial Officer at Idea Statica Entrepreneur of the Year in South Moravia. And once again, Mike Stenson, 
Head of Innovation at Kingspan Group. It seems we will share one microphone, so I hope we will handle it. Well, I already said a little, but Kurt, could you briefly introduce the goals of the Green Deal and its metrics and in what stage it is right now? Yes, thank you very much. First of all, I should say I'm, I'm really happy to be here um, and to feel the vibe of uh, innovation in this room. It, it's really great and congratulations for um, organizing this event. Um, it's really good. Um, I was very happy to listen to the two preceding uh, presentations. Um, you said it all, what the Green Deal is about. Uh, we launched it in 2019 as a new growth, innovation and investment strategy. And I think the presentations before us, uh, really before the panel discussion, showed that actually it works. It does stimulate innovation, it does stimulate investment, and it makes sure that we will have growth in the future. Because what we're seeing, and I think it's obvious to all of us, that the business as usual economic growth has reached its limits uh, because of the climate change that we're witnessing, but also it's become very, very clear that we can no longer rely for our economy and societal well-being on fossil fuels. So we need to go towards a new kind, a new model of economic uh, growth. And that is what the European Green Deal is about. Now, at the core, at the heart of that European Green Deal is the mission, as you said, to make Europe the first climate neutral continent by 2050. We're not alone, and many others in the world are following on this path. Um, but obviously, um, and, and we have, um, and that's important to say, with 27 member states and the European Parliament, in 2020, we have democratically agreed to make this a binding objective in European law. So it is no longer only an aspirational or political goal, it is something that is now bind in law that we need to reach with a minimum emission reduction of 55% by 2030. But obviously, uh, becoming climate neutral or reducing emissions by 55% um, over the next eight years requires much more than only cutting emissions. It's really a transformative change of the way we produce, the way we consume, the way we live, that was very clear in the preceding um, presentations, the way we move and organize our mobility, the, the, the way we basically live and work on this uh, planet. So that's why it is a transformative agenda for Europe, where we look not only at climate and energy, but also at industrial policy, transport policy, agriculture, food production, production and consumption, the way we treat and protect our nature, and many, many other dimensions, including the whole international dimension, trade policy, climate diplomacy, energy diplomacy, which is becoming more important than ever. Um, we can go into further details, uh, if you like, in the presentation, but there's one thing I would like to say. Um, we launched indeed um, the Green Deal at the end of 2019 when uh, the von der Leyen Commission took office. We didn't know that the COVID-19 pandemic would strike just three months after we started. And there was a lot of hesitation at that moment in mid-2020. Many people saying, well, in the midst of this pandemic, let's pause a little with the European Green Deal, um, because what matters now is the economy. And actually what happened is that because of the pandemic and thanks to the pandemic, the Green Deal came out stronger out of it. Um, and we now have the next generation EU program with massive investments to all member states, where at least almost 40% 40, 40 of the money from Brussels to help the pandemic, the recovery from the pandemic, is going to climate and green objectives. And we know that because of what we are experiencing now with this unjustified war provoked by Russia on Ukraine, 
we are not showing or, or seeing our vulnerability in terms of dependence on Russian fossil fuels and on fossil fuels in general. And we are convinced that this will again reinforce the goals of the European Green Deal and the commitment uh, to realize these goals. Because today, climate policy is energy policy, but is also security policy. Security against the incredible impacts from climate change, but also security policy in the geopolitical sense of uh, the word. So we are very confident um, that um, the Green Deal will remain our compass, uh, that we will stay the course. And when I see the presentations and when I feel the vibes in this room today, I am more confident than ever. So thank you. Well, let's find out what the other panelists think about the Green Deal. Thank you very much for reminding us what it is. And I would like to ask especially Radek and Juraj uh, if you can uh, briefly uh, describe your personal attitude towards the Green Deal, if you agree on what was said by Kurt. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Well, there are different kind of, kinds of vibes that uh, Green Deal... Uh, uh, Green Deal produces in the meetings that uh, that I have uh, with our members in the Confederation of Industry or even uh, within Business Europe uh, that I also have the privilege to represent, represent since uh, January 1st. Uh, it's not going to be easy for anyone uh, to reach uh, net zero in, uh, in 2050 uh, and it's going to be even more difficult for some economies, uh, especially those uh, similar to the Czech economy given the structure of our industry and, and given how industrialized uh, we are as a country. In fact, we are the most industrialized economy in the EU. Uh, for us, it's going to be more expensive uh, and more difficult. Uh, we are now in, uh, in a discussion with the European Commission concerning the specific initiatives within Green Deal, within Fit for 55 and other, uh, uh, and other programs. Uh, some are doable, uh, some uh, hardly, some uh, we consider impossible, but uh, it's a dialogue, so, so we'll see what, uh, what gets out of it. What I would like to say is that uh, we don't question Green Deal, we take it as a reality, uh, and mostly because it's not, uh, it's not the EU green craziness. Uh, if somebody wants to call it uh, green craziness, then uh, it's a global craziness. You know, it's a it's a global mega trend, uh, and we can either agree with it, we can disagree, but that's uh, as we say in the Czech Republic, that's it. Uh, that's that's all we can do about it. And we are not seeing only the European Commission pushing us in this direction. We see financial markets. Uh, look at Tesla and its evaluation. It sends a clear signal where. Capital markets want uh, car makers to go in the in the future. We are pressed by the banks in a nasty way, I would say. Uh, if you want to get a get a loan nowadays, you, know, you will have to provide your carbon footprint, and uh, if it's not sufficient, then you will pay. Uh, so that's extremely difficult for for us to bypass somehow. So banks are playing a very important role in this whole enterprise. But at the same time, we are also pressed by our employees and our customers. It's becoming more and more important for them. And for us, it's a clear message that we have to get used to it somehow. As I said, it's not going to be easy. Easier for startups, for technological companies, pharmaceuticals, etc. But for the companies I represent, steelworks, uh, glass factories, etc., it's a real challenge, I have to say. You're right, you represent local SME operating from Brno. So what is your attitude towards the Green Deal, the green craziness? Thanks for the invitation. I love the goal. 250, zero uh, carbon emission. I think that uh, we got that right. <laughs> and that's something that people can rally uh, uh, around. And that makes sense. It makes sense in Europe. Hopefully, will will motivate and uh, and, and uh, be an inspiration in the in the rest of the world too. The way, uh, how to achieve it, right? To me, uh, that's for discussion. From what I uh, see in the Green Deal and I read through all the initiatives, 
it's just too much regulation. The way we, we chose is, is that we want to interfere as uh, European Union and as a state level into how uh, our economy is operated. And as the beautiful goal is, uh, opportunity, and it is right, the, the current set of uh, how the Green Deal is structured is also a threat to uh, free markets, right? And that's the cornerstone of our economy, that's the cornerstone of our, of our success, how our society operates, what the values it holds dear. And uh, I would very much like to, uh, to be a, a model for the rest of the world in that too. <laughs> Mike, do you see it as too much regulation as someone who represents a company that does so much in terms of sustainability? Yeah, I, I would say uh, two things. First of all, I'd, uh, I share a lot of the um, points that um, uh, Radek mentioned in relation to industrial decarbonization. It's going to be the most difficult um, feature. And obviously, more industrialized economies is going to be more difficult. Um, as I said in the presentation, there are lots of challenges that are ongoing, right? But I mean, de you know, if we could end up somehow magically decarbonizing the electricity grid, the energy supply system, which is enormous in its own right, um, that would be a huge transformational aid, if you like, to even the most industrial of, of, um, uh, con of companies. Um, I think there is a risk in the in, in the paperwork, if you like, in terms of the bureaucracy. But also, um, I mean, typically, you know, funding and getting access to funding is and can be overly complicated. And I think, you know, for such a transition to happen, I think easier, less bureaucratic access to money, to funding is really important. Um, and there is that risk, and, and in a paradoxical way of, you know, hampering a free uh, market-based economy um, if it becomes too too uh, regulated. Radek would like to follow on what was yeah. said by Mike. I, I realized that I was uh, too general, vague, and, and superficial, so I'll try to use a specific <laughs> example to illustrate what I meant, uh, and that's e-mobility. Uh, so the first point was that uh, this is not a new only uh, initiative. Uh, you know that uh, on the table there is a ban for the sales of new cars uh, with combustion engine since uh, 2035. It's just a commission's proposal. We will deal with it as a, as a new presidency, but uh, I assume that it actually will be approved. Uh, so that's the regulation that you, that you talked about. My point was that this is not only about the EU, and the best example of that is Great Britain. Great Britain is a country which left the EU a few years ago in order to avoid these types of European craziness in the area of social policy, environmental policy, regulation, etc., etc. And guess what? Uh, they have already agreed so it's not a, just a proposal, as in our case, which can change, actually. And our prime minister is saying that he will try to change it, so we'll see. But in the Great Britain, it has, it has been already agreed that uh, they will ban the sales of new cars with combustion engine in 2030, five years before the European Union. So this is a clear signal that this is not about the EU and some countries, even more conservative countries, with less regulation in a number of areas, are going even faster. So that's, that's an example I wanted to, uh, to say at the beginning. But secondly, and I have to say that I, I totally agree with what you said, this is a very ambitious goal. I think that there are countries uh, which are not ready for that, Czech Republic included. We can go back to it if you, if you want. But the mistake that the European Union and the European Commission is doing is, for example, to set this goal, 2035, and at the same time push for Euro 7. That does not make any sense. It, uh, it represents a huge burden uh, for European car makers. It will be extremely costly for them, and it will really uh, deteriorate their already very difficult situation. So see, th this is the point I wanted to make. Uh, ambitious goals, fine, why not? But then the regulation must uh, 
must comply uh, and must help the real economy to adapt. And in this respect, uh, I think that the Euro European Commission is simply making a mistake to combine these ambitious goals with uh, the introduction of Europe 7. Okay, Kurt, <laughs> there's now opportunity for you to react. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, two quick points. First, it will not be easy. Let, let's not have any illusions. This is not a walk in the park. No, we know this. Um, and it will be more difficult for some member states than for others. That is very clear uh, to us. But first we should say, um, the title of this panel was uh, Green Deal, Threat or Opportunity. The real threat would be if there was no Green Deal. Because change will happen. Change will happen. So the question is, do we want change by disaster? Or do we want change by design? And that is what the European Green Deal is about. It's laying out a pathway, a blueprint of policies so that we can design our future and that we're not hit by changes that we don't want. Um, and it is true that um, we have to be very mindful of a just transition so that we don't leave anyone behind, no citizens, but also no region or member states. That's why at the heart of our Green Deal, we have the whole just transition agenda. And we are mobilizing lots of funds, billions and billions of euros to help regions that are in transition. Because I think we all agree that the long-term goal is necessary um, more than ever, but the difficulty will be in the transition. And that's what Europe is there for. It's to mobilize funds and support um, and accompanying policies to help regions that are indeed in an industrial stage of development to help make that transition. And I'm told that uh, also in the Czech Republic, uh, there are very good examples of, for example, the region of Karlova Vary, where the 27 ambassadors to the European Union will be visiting this week to see what is happening in such a region, uh, which has coal mining, late night mining, but at the same time is a test bed for um, self-driving vehicles uh, from BMW. And it shows what is happening. And this is not only in the Czech Republic. This is happening across the European Union. When we look at the figures for clean tech investment, which are an important indicator for the dynamism of the European Green Deal, we saw that there was an enormous jump in venture capital investment in 2021 in clean tech. Uh, from 4 billion to 11 billion. So it shows that the Green Deal has an effect. A lot of this funding or this venture capital investment is happening indeed in the Nordic countries and in France and Germany because they're big economies. But if you decline it by per capita, then you see that actually it's much better spread. There are lots of very interesting venture capital investments happening in startups and scale ups in countries like Lithuania, Croatia, um, Estonia, etc. Um, so it shows that there is a dynamic everywhere, and we have to make sure that we reinforce that dynamic and that we indeed get the industry on board for the industrial uh, transformation. And by the way, a lot of that new investment in clean tech goes into clean steel, for example, uh, which is catching a lot of that uh, investment. Um, second point, regulation. I agree with you, we have to be very, very careful on regulation. And you know, we have a better regulation agenda. We impact assess all the regulations uh, that we put on the table. Regulation is not our first priority for the Green Deal. Um, for us, as I said, the Green Deal is an investment and innovation agenda. What we really want in the first place is to make sure that we use the market mechanisms, that we, in other words, use pricing as a tool. That is our first priority. So that pollution has a price, and that drives innovation, that drives the choice of consumers, etc. And regulation only comes in when the pricing or the market mechanisms are not sufficient or cannot re repair the market failures. Um, and that is, for example, the case indeed in the car sector, uh, where we have proposed uh, to not ban combustion engines, I know it is often said like this, 
but to have only sales of zero emission vehicles by 2035. Now, in essence, this boils down to the same thing, I know. But what is important is that we're not prescribing technological solutions. We set the direction. We make sure that it is applying to everyone in our big single market. But then we leave it to the industry to go there. And if it is the industry deciding whether it is electric vehicles or hydrogen vehicles or other types of vehicles, that's up to the market. That's up to innovation. Um, on the Euro 7, we have not tabled the Euro 7 proposal yet. That is still in the making. And I can tell you that we hear you and we are not um, interested in putting a Euro 7 proposal on the table that would make it too difficult for our car manufacturers. Um, we need to look at Euro 7. Um, for those who are not in the know of this, Euro 7 are about all the other emissions than CO2. Um, nitrogen, um, particulate matter, etc. Now, we may need to make sure that the combustion engine cars that will still drive on the roads for another 30, 40 years, but that we will also continue to export to other parts of the world, are not polluting more than the modern technology can address. And that is what we will try to do with Euro 7 uh, proposals. Last point, if I may, sorry for talking too long. Um, access to finance is a very important point. Um, we are aware of this. Uh, we have a, an issue in Europe, because if we look at the venture capital, for example, way too much venture capital. First, we're much smaller in venture capital and clean tech also than in other parts of the world, like US and China, where the sums invested are much bigger. But secondly, we have a problem because most of that venture capital is coming from governmental sources, not from private finance. Um, and obviously, there is an issue if government is having to invest in venture capital because governments are using taxpayers' money and we have to be very careful and responsible with every euro we fund, especially in risky projects that are venture capital type. So we have to make sure that we create a real capital markets union where we mobilize a lot more of the money that is around because money is not the problem in our economy today. There is too much money. Um, with inflation, it's changing a bit, but there's a lot of money around. We have to channel all that money into the right investments uh, for the future. Okay, so let's be specific now. How can the Czech companies taken on board to discuss regulations and uh, specific details of the Green Deal and its uh, execution? Uh, if there is someone who wants to be heard, who wants to have an impact uh, on how it's designed, what can they do? For example, URI. <laughs> uh, well, uh, let me come <laughs> back to that first. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, EU is distributing a lot of money, but at the first place, we are taking a lot of money from the economy. The GDP of European Union, 17 trillion euros. Total tax take, 7.5 trillion. 40% of the whole GDP is, is collected in combined taxes national uh, EU-wide. So if we want to give money to the businesses and the people, we just can lower the taxes, we don't have to bring them. I, I, I'm not sure why sh that should be a default, that there's a problem and, and somebody will bring in money. The Frederick's presentation, you, you saw that. One of the biggest reasons why businesses want to change is not that some officer or regulatory body will tell them, it's that their customers will tell them, right? That, that they want to be uh, more sustainable, they value the sustainable products and services and let's bring in the most important stakeholder in the discussion. It's 450 million citizens of European Union. They are making the decisions about consumption every day. That's a trillion of decisions per day that have CO2 footprint in how we, what we consume, what we throw away, what we don't consume, what we don't purchase. And uh, that's an incredible market. And if, we, if these people start making better decisions, and we see that they are, they are demanding better products from companies, the companies will do it. And there's no need to have a special fund. There's no need to have special rules, initiatives. The 
society will do it. We, we have what it takes. We have incredible talent across all the segments. And uh, as a business like ours, and an SME, 10 million euros, we are, we are seeing this as a business opportunity. We see this as another unique value proposition to our customers, and uh, we hope they will value it. And we need help in somebody educating those far, 450 million people better to make them understand what the CO2 uh, is, actually, <laughs> and uh, how it is produced, what are the consequences. And if those people are educated, they will, it will trickle down to businesses, and millions of decisions will be made without actually someone saying, yes, this is right, or this is, this is not right. Yeah, I want to be part of that process, and, uh, and uh, uh, I'm very optimistic that we can do it much more with focus on, on the people, the companies, and less on the state. So how to be part of the process, not only informally, but also in terms of having some influence on what's what's being cooked <laughs> in the EU. It's maybe through people like Radek and the Confederation of Industry of the Czech Republic, or how can Czech companies be heard to somehow be able to tackle the green transition in the right way? Yeah. You are maybe the, <laughs> the well, logical the, the helper answer, in that. Now the answer is very, uh, is very simple, uh, to become a member of the Confederation of Industry <laughs> uh, on the national level and, and then help us uh, fight for our, not only rights, but uh, for our interests on the European level uh, through Business Europe, which is, uh, which is the biggest employers association in the, in the EU. And I have to say in this respect that uh, this process is going very well. Uh, there is a dialogue between the Commission and, uh, and stakeholders, and not only employers, but also labor unions. I'm meeting uh, on a regular basis with Josef Stredula, at the moment combining the, the role of the president of uh, labor union with uh, the presidential candidate in the, in the Czech Republic. And we are meeting together on the social summits, where we have uh, an opportunity on a regular basis, actually, uh, to meet face-to-face -face with, uh, with the president of the council, uh, chairwoman of the European Commission and other, and other commissioners, so the dialogue is there. Uh, if there is one thing that I could, uh, I could mention in front of Kurt and ask him to uh, transfer that message uh, to, his, uh, to his colleagues, that would be uh, a little bit more uh, focus on the regulatory impact assessment. It's an important part of the legislative process on the national level here in the Czech Republic. It should be as important uh, on the European level. And some proposals within, especially Fit 455 proposals, didn't have a proper uh, regulatory impact assessment. Some did, some didn't have it. Uh, and I think it's, it's quite, uh, quite a weakness because especially when it comes to these sensitive issues like uh, energy efficiency and others, there should be a proper, uh, proper impact assessment to know uh, how costly it is gonna be for European businesses. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Radek, for uh, saying that the dialogue is going well. We attach a lot of importance to this dialogue uh, with Business Europe, also with other business federations, with trade unions, with NGOs, the whole civil society. Um, actually, the business dialogue, the dialogue with business is going so well that we're often criticized for being captured by business interests, uh, which I personally don't think is fair. But um, we do believe it's very important. I take your point on the impact assessments. We always have to improve further. Um, but I should also say there's probably no other jurisdiction in the world that is doing such impact assessments. Um, and the impact assessments are indeed very important because for us they provide a, a factual basis for discussing with business and with the council um, and the parliament all the proposals we put on the table. Um, in terms of uh, regulation, um, what I would like to say is that uh, the usual game in Brussels is that the Commission comes with a proposal often asked by the European Parliament. The European Parliament, which is directly elected by 450 million Europeans, are always asking, almost always asking, to make it more demanding, not less, more demanding, and the Council is asking to make it less demanding. And often, the Commission's proposal are midway between what the Parliament directly elected wants and what the Council uh, wants. Um, 
So I don't think that we're um, exaggerating with creating too much state uh, because or with the European Green Deal. What is true is that we are living in a social market economy in Europe, which we treasure. And we have to make sure that the public intervenes where the market is failing. And what we do see is that indeed the consumer behavior is driving a lot of these changes. We should reinforce that. And we're doing what we can with green claims, etc., to make sure that the consumers are putting pressure on industry so that we don't have to do it through regulation. But unfortunately, the market itself will not always do it. Um, because there is always an incumbent economic interest that wants to keep things as they are, even if we know it is not in the interest of society and especially in the interest of the next generations. And that's what we, as public institutions, have to care about, that there is also a future for the next uh, generations. And by the way, um, and I'll close on this, um, on the taxation burden, um, this is a very topical issue for the moment because all governments, including the one of the Czech Republic, wants more European budget to help consumer pay their energy bills. We are not asking for more taxation. It is governments that put pressure on us to help people pay their consumer bill, their energy bills. Um, and that is a big, as you know, a very divisive discussion for the moment uh, in Brussels, which we are resisting. We have made proposals yesterday to make sure that the windfall profits, the surplus revenues that companies in the energy sector make, uh, profits that they had never dreamed of before, are rechanneled to those in society and economy, small and medium enterprises included, that can no longer afford uh, the bills. Because we don't want to go, we don't want anyone to go overboard and not being able to pay the bills. Um, but we don't want, we, or let's say we resist calls for having more taxpayers' money going simply into paying the bills, the energy bills of consumers. I understand that it's uh, it's totally uh, not easy, and, and we have to look. I know it, that that's the problem on the table, right? We're talking 2050, right? So, so how do we get the the 450 million uh, people behave different? It's, there's there's also 25 million companies in in Europe, and you ma mentioned the taxation to to put a price on the on the pollution, and if there is a market in intervention to be made, it's the put a price on, on, on CO2, on the carbon tax. Uh, and uh, it's been heavily discussed, and I would be very happy if the EU sets the uh, standard in it. Uh, where are we today? We have the carbon emission trading system in place, which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think last year it collected 15 billion euros. Uh, the total tax take is 7 trillion. Okay, so, so in total in Europe, we collect 7 trillion euros in in taxes and in carbon emission training, 15 uh, uh, billion was collected, just 0.2% of all the taxes. So if we are saying that taxes should change the behavior of somebody, that's, that's not enough, right? That's like taking an oil tank that's going in a direction and I s swim next to it and try to try to push it, right? We need the bigger gun, huh? a much, much bigger gun. Uh, the price per carbon we put through that, it's cents per megaton or it's very, I think Mike, you have it like 80 euros per, per ton, right? So we have a kind of feeling for what changes behavior, right? If we get a price tag on, on roughly 80 euros per ton of CO2, that's a signal that changes behavior. And that means uh, that the carbon, uh, I wouldn't say carbon emission training, but the whole system of taxation should then be in that volumes to change behavior. Huh? And I directly contradict myself that, that what would the total tax take would be then for the, uh, for the uh, euro. So that immediately means we need to decrease some other taxes, specifically taxes on labor and income. So we keep the total taxation uh, at least not rising, right? We would ideally, uh, would ideally decrease it. Just on, on the carbon tax, I mean, I'd make a big distinction between 
what companies are doing, like ourselves, internally, where it's really intended to change behaviors in units and businesses across the world that may not see this as important. Um, you know, so if you take your business here in Czech or Poland or elsewhere, they now have an incentive because they can use that penalty factor as a justification for getting a capital investment approved that they may not be able to do otherwise. But I think it becomes a completely much more complicated topic when you talk about it generally speaking. Um, and, and, and I'd make the distinction between what a company might do to effect internal change and whether that mechanism is the same for uh, change at society level. And I wouldn't really know enough about that, honestly, to, to say it. Uh, all I can say is internally, it's, it's looking like it's going to work very well because it's um, going to keep a focus on CO2 reduction and it's going to um, give incentives to our people to, you know, effect change. And for us, it's very important because, you know, the construction industry um, has, you know, generates something like 40% of the CO2 emissions. 28% um, is that from buildings, and therefore the whole renovation agenda is going to be enormous. And that's why, back to the first point, I mean, at least in our case, it's an opportunity, but do recognize that elsewhere it may be a significant uh, challenge. Well, there is not much time left, but still, we have a few minutes. Exactly, we are running out of time. We see it here, so I'm getting nervous because there's, uh, there's one more thing I would like to add, and that's energy policy in general. Uh, Kurt, please, uh, let's, <laughs> let's, be, let's be more rational and more pragmatic when it comes to energy policy on the European level, and I'll be very specific in this respect. We are representing thousands of companies, uh, and I have the opportunity to, to meet with, the, with their boards, with their owners, uh, with their management. And they tell me what it's going to represent for them uh, to produce in a clean way. Uh, specific example, Chinese Casual is Army. Fantastic company, uh, Steelworks uh, in, uh, in Moravia. And if you talk to, uh, to Mr. Chudek, their, their CEO or their owner, they tell you if... The, that if they were to produce clean steel, which in their respect means to use clean hydrogen, they would need so much electricity that it basically equals an annual production of Dukovany power plant for two factories. Almost annual production of Dukovany power plant. What I'm trying to say is that Green Deal will mean that we will need much more energy that we are consuming at the moment. And when you take into account that we went through taxonomy, during which some countries were arguing that we don't need nuclear energy, that gas is dirty, and then we can go along only with renewables, I think this is not rational. It's a, it's a victory of ideology over uh, rationalism, I guess. So please, again, in this respect, European Commission was on the right side, in, in my opinion, but we have to continue fighting against those states. I will not name them. Germany at the first place, <laughs> Austria, second place, <laughs> which really think that we can decarbonize and fulfill the ambitious goals of Green Deal without nuclear energy. I think it's a nonsense. Well, Radek, first of all, I should say, we at the European Commission, we don't fight against member states. We uh, work with all member states in the European collective uh, interest. Um, secondly, um, energy is, of course, the key topic uh, these days. Um, and when we launched the European Green Deal in 2019, in the back of our mind was also the big bill we're paying every year for energy imports. We import 90% um, of our gas. We imported 90% of the gas we use in Europe. More than 90% of oil, 70% of coal. In 2019, before the pandemic, our yearly bill, the money we sent out of Europe to suppliers of energy, fossil energy, was 300 billion euros per year. This is probably a triple or a quadruple this year because of the rising energy prices. 
So it is very clear that for us in the future, in Europe, if we want independence and meeting our climate goals, renewables and other low carbon sources of energy, and low carbon in the Euro, Euro speak is nuclear, uh, um, will be our energy mix for the future. First of all, renewables, because they are a no regret, they are limitless. In all the projections we are making from the European Commission, there is always a part for nuclear, also in 2050. Um, our latest projections were that nuclear in 2050 would still represent about 15% of the energy mix. Um, but as you know, Radek, um, the energy mix are a national competence. Europe has nothing to say about the energy mix of countries. <laughs> um, so we don't decide uh, on this um, and we can argue whether this is the right way to go. I think this will need to be discussed in the future um, because we are seeing the limits today of um, the need for European solutions but at the same time having a full autonomy by member states deciding on their energy uh, mix. So we will have to have a debate uh, on this once maybe the acute phase of the crisis is currently over. That's also why the European Commission has tabled the taxonomy, which has been hotly dis discussed, um, which does not regulate what type of energy is allowed or not allowed. It says what kind of investment in what kind of energy can be considered sustainable or transitional towards climate neutrality. Um, and we have proposed, um, after lots of difficult debate, that indeed certain forms of nuclear energy, especially the next generation um, of nuclear energy, can be sustainable in the sense that it contributes to the transition to climate neutrality. Um, we also included, cert under certain very strict conditions, gas in that taxonomy uh, delegated act. But I think we all know now um, that gas will be much less a transitional fuel uh, for the transition to climate neutrality because these days solar and wind energy are actually much cheaper to go directly from coal to renewables rather than from coal to gas as was always the scenario until Putin decided to invade uh, Ukraine. So I think in terms of gas we are Incre increasingly seeing that there is no future for gas in, in, in Europe. Nuclear is probably, as I said, part of our energy mix uh, in the future. And if we talk about clean tech investment, actually nuclear is probably a sector where we will see a revival of investment, of skills, of training, especially nuclear fusion, which is the holy grail of the future, will not be there in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years, but it is something we are heavily investing in uh, at European level, but also the fourth generation of nuclear will probably have a, a revival now, and small modular reactors. But again, let me be very clear, the European Union has no authority over the energy mix that member states decide for themselves. We're looking far to the future. It should have. <laughs> we have only two minutes left, so please, gentlemen, if you have some final statements, just one sentence to sum it up. If you want to add something that is important that you think that is needed to be heard here in this audience that consists of local entrepreneurs and uh, scientists and policymakers, please say that. <laughs> We've got a great goal. we get great people, great companies. Hopefully great politicians, right? I know, it, I know we are putting a lot of heat on you, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can do it. We can absolutely do it, and uh, it doesn't have to be a, a, a painful process. It can be a process that will invigorate the, the European society, its businesses, and solidify the, the West values and the, um, and the our position in the world and the, as, as a beacon of, uh, beacon of place to live, right? right? Place to look up to. Thank you, Juraj. So from my point of view, I think the, the transition is underway. Um, I think the challenge is going to be enormous. Um, and I think for those that are going to have it as its most challenging, they need to be fully supported. Like the example that Radek gave of the, 
steel company. I mean, that's the reality. We see it in our business, you know, all the time. Thank you, Mike. I'm done. I've said everything <laughs> I wanted. <laughs> and the last, very last sentence from Kurt. Thank you. Um, I like the yes, we can uh, <laughs> mentality. Um, we at the European level will not realize, uh, in Brussels, we will not realize the Green Deal. What we can do is set the policy, the direction. We don't want to prescribe solutions. We can provide an enabling framework, but it are the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the scientists, the companies that will do it. Um, you are the real makers of the transition to the climate uh, neutral continents that we need, and we are there to support you. Thank you very much, Kurt. Applause for four gentlemen presenting their attitudes to the Green Deal.